six watt work. Um, we have a radar altimeter, which is a more traditional kind of altimeter, gives us precise but very small strip maps. We have a microwave radiometer that's used to correct uh, the altimeter measurement in terms of the, the water vapor as the signal is going through the Earth's atmosphere. And we also need a set of uh, instrumentation that, that tells us the, a very accurate position of the spacecraft in space itself. We have a, a GPS receiver that you don't see here, it's inside. Um, we have a DORA system, uh, and we have the laser retroreflector array. And can you let us know how SWAT will communicate? Data, first of all, one type of science data every day that has to be downlinked and then processed into products. Uh, the key to being able to do that, of course, is we have a very large recorder, uh, memory recorder inside the, the module here, but then getting it out is, is the job of this antenna system, that's the X-band antenna system, that's downlinking at 600 megabit per second, uh, and um, we also have an S-band system that's more for command and control and basic mission operations. We obviously can't take a SWAT like this in space. How will it fold and unfold? Yeah. Launch. So uh, the whole system is, of course, needs to be compact. It's folded off to the side of the payload module that you see here. And it, it basically deploys in three phases, one that's first coming up and then moving out. And then the antennas finally deploying on the side themselves. And then the whole system is locked in place. It's a very interesting explanation. Thank you so much, Parag. Of course. Happy to do that. Time to check in with the launch team at the Mission Director Center to see how the countdown is progressing. Megan and Denton, how are we looking? So we are T minus 21 minutes and 59 seconds and counting until liftoff and fueling of the SpaceX Falcon 9 uh, continues, right Denton? Yep, it's continuing, it's progressing just fine. Um, everything is moving along as, as it should. Great, great news. Uh, so the U.S. Space Force, we know, is responsible for the range, you know, making sure it's safe to fly uh, our intended trajectory. Any concerns there? Um, no, actually. Um, the range is green right now. Weather's looking good. All, all the assets in the correct configuration. And so we're all completely green right now. Talk to me about trajectories. You know, th that it's not an easy task to design no. one, right? <laughs> that, that's where a lot of the real rocket science is, is to design a trajectory. It's basically you're trying to get from the launch pad to a point in space. And along the way, there is some things you may encounter, the other, other orbiting satellites, um, some debris up there. So you have to make sure you avoid it. And the work that goes into it is very interesting interesting because the team has a very detailed uh, model of uh, analytical model of how the launch vehicle will perform and they marry that with everything that's orbiting the earth and trying to understand which paths we can take when we can launch times etc i mean there's a lot of work that goes into it and this that's where a lot of the real rocket science is done yeah and we're talking about years of work right yes yes in some cases it's, it's you know over a period of years where you kind of develop in your trajectory for the spacecraft and then also develop in the trajectory for the launch vehicle so it's it's a lot of work that goes into it yeah today's launch will uh, you know be a, a huge moment for a lot of people who have worked their trajectory mm -hmm. who have worked on this spacecraft yeah. uh, who've worked on the vehicle yeah. uh, you know it's 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 many years of of, yes, of hard work. yes. It's been 20 years since some of the folks who's, who've been working on a spacecraft has been working this mission. So, I mean, it's it's it's, it's going to be an exciting time for everybody. And now here they can see again their space uh, spacecraft sitting in the payload fairing yeah. at the top of the Falcon 9 on, on the launch pad here at Vandenberg. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Space Force also monitors the weather for us. And again, let's take a look at the weather graphic we have prepared for you guys. The launch weather officer reporting 100% go for launch Amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it's very rare to see that, but we're, we're, we're happy to have it. <laughs> Absolutely. And s speaking of seeing, um, it seems like we are going to see the launch today, right? Visibility is looking amazing, you know, not not the typical fog we, we usually yeah. see here. Yeah, it's usually foggy here, but we're, we're in for a treat because we actually get some uh, clear day today so we can actually see the launch vehicle. Yeah. And then here we see some of the venting we were talking about. Uh, you know, we, we have to vent right to maintain the right yes. kind of pressure. That is correct. I mean, and you just you will see this as a normal part of it. Um, you'll see it kind of cycling on and off throughout the count, just maintaining um, the appropriate pressure within the tanks. And this is venting of liquid oxygen, right? That is correct. OK. All right. So everything is looking good. Can't wait to see this launch as we were talking about. So we'll send it back to you, Raquel and Nadia. All right, thank you so much, Megan and Denton. Joining us now on the West Coast is Janet Petro, the Center Director for Kennedy Space Center on the East Coast in Florida. Thank you for joining us today, Janet. Oh, thank you, Raquel. Happy to be here. 
great. Now, most launches take place at Kennedy, but sometimes, like today, we launch from Vandenberg. And why is that? Yeah, so um, the Launch Services Program has multiple locations where they launch from. And so, as you mentioned, we're here today on the California coast, and we have several locations uh, in Florida, but also as far away as Alaska and New Zealand. I mean, it generally depends on the science mission itself, right? The science mission and ultimately the orbit that it needs to be in um, to conduct its science. So, in general, um, we launch from the East Coast when we need an equatorial mission. Um, and then in the case of today, where we're looking more at the polar missions, we generally launch out of the um, West Coast here at Vandenberg. And tell us more about the Kennedy Space Center involvement in launches here at Vandenberg. So the Kennedy Space Center, we are very, very ha uh, proud to host the Launch Services Program. And we've been doing so since uh, 1998. Uh, and that program, um, I'm very proud of that program. I tend to think of them as the world-renowned experts in launch vehicles, and they really, really do understand um, all of the launch vehicles and provide a great service um, to, our age, to our agency. Um, they really do the end-to-end -end services on, on launching a mission. You know, they'll work with the spacecraft providers, they'll work on the, the design, um, they provide data, telemetry, and then like, you know, today we're providing the, um, the launch services, the mission assurance for uh, each of the missions. And like I said, they've been doing it since 1998. They do a really, really great job wherever, whatever location uh, the mission is going out of. So very, very proud of that, uh, proud of that program, and we host them out of the Kennedy Space Center. That's an excellent program, Janet. And what are uh, Earth-related missions that are coming up for you in the near future? Oh, um, goodness, I am so focused on this year. <laughs> you know, we just had the JPSS-2 and lofted, um, and now the um, and now what we're doing today with SWAT. I'm trying to think next year. Um, we have a little bit of a break until uh, uh, April uh, coming up. We did earlier this year launch the uh, GOES mission. Right. Um, launches. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can't, and you know, of course the, um, yeah, other missions outside of the launch services program, of course we do the, the crew to the International right. Space Station, we do the cargo to the International mm -hmm. uh, Space Station, and you know, we just came from, our big mission was Artemis, and very, very uh, proud to get that mm -hmm. uh, launched out of our patent. You know, we just recovered the uh, vehicle down in um, so San Diego, mm -hmm. and that was an incredible um, experience. The Exploration Ground Systems Program down at Kennedy. They're the ones responsible for the front end, the launch uh, piece uh, uh, of that uh, program, and then the recovery operation uh, here on the West Coast, and they did a, a really outstanding job. We had a tremendously busy year at the Kennedy Space Center, and it's our, I like to say it's our diamond anniversary, our 60th anniversary. So it was a great way to really cap off the year with Artemis and now um, ending with the uh, uh, SWAT program here tonight. We had um, a record number of launches. We're, some, we're at like something like 53 launches um, that we supported from the East Coast. And, wow. and our center supports whether it launches on our property, Kennedy Space Center property, or on the Space Force property, uh, Cape Canaveral. We provide all kinds of services, whether it's our propellant services or standing up our EOC. Um, and so if you think about yeah. that, 53 launches, yes. that's about that's a fantastic one, one a week, year. one yeah. a yes. week. Thank you, Janet, so much for Thank that you happy all. anniversary. Now, there is a growing community of scientists eager to use SWAT data. Let's go to Jasmine live at the Hawk's Nest to meet one of them. Yes, Raquel, that is right. I'm here with somebody who is also eager to get his hands on that SWAT data. Toby Minear with the Ceres Group from CU Boulder in Colorado. Welcome, Toby. Thank you. Glad we are, to be here. We are so glad to have you here. You are a research hydrologist with that group. So can you tell me what are some of the applications of SWAT? Well, SWAT is amazing because it has this uh, really unique capability of measuring water levels over a big area. And so for people that are water managers in particular, um, there's a lot of excitement there because uh, we really don't have this kind of capability at present. We have to do these things from the field, individual point measurements and things like that that are very hard to make in the field. Um, and so we have a lot of interest from people that are like uh, municipal water agencies, uh, state agencies uh, for dam safety, um, federal agencies, um, all really interested in getting their hands on some water level data in particular and storage change. 
Um, so be very exciting to see it. It is very exciting. And really what I hear you saying is that SWAT is changing the game. So what are some of those specific applications, maybe agriculture or, you know, flood zones? How is it changing our lives in our own backyard? Yeah, well, so a few things that it will change are, um, so for example, flood risk. Um, we really don't have a good sense of where flooding occurs and when and why. Um, so how much water requires uh, flooding to occur. Um, so, for example, uh, a good place for that is on the coast. Um, we don't really have very many gauges along the coast um, at the freshwater and uh, saltwater interface. And so, uh, yeah, I think we'll see a lot of changes there, a lot of changes inland um, for uh, lakes and wetlands too. Wow, that's really exciting. And I understand, Toby, you're also in this group called the Early Adopters. What is that and, and who's in that? Uh, yeah, so the Early Adopters group is about 25 different uh, organizations. Uh, they come from all over the world. And these are people that are interested in SWAT data. They've heard sort of through the grapevine that there's uh, some data coming out for water level data. And these are agencies that are non-governmental organizations. They're governmental organizations ranging from city uh, level uh, water agencies up to federal agencies. So a lot of excitement there from the, the water community. Right, very exciting. Toby, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Raquel, back to you. Thank you so much. This will be the last launch for NASA's Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Thomas Zerbukin. During Thomas's six years in the role, he has overseen nearly 100 science missions, including SWAT, DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, the Mars 2020 mission, and the James Webb Telescope. He also co-authored and authored more than 200 articles and received many agency awards. Congratulations, Thomas. Congratulations, Thomas. Yes, Thomas will be missed. Uh, he is known for his uh, energy, uh, dedication, and scientific curiosity. Uh, I, when I was doing my first lunch with him, Sentinel-6, uh, Mike Friley, he was very supportive. So yeah, Thomas will be missed. But congratulations, enjoy, well deserved. Absolutely, enjoy that. <laughs> uh, the president of France's space agency, CNES, Philippe Baptiste, sent us this message about today's launch. The result of NASA and CNES historic partnership in oceanography that all started more than 30 years ago with Topex Poseidon is really essential. And I'm very proud to send you this message and to be with you, at least in spirit, for this launch. I want to say once again a few words how proud CNES and its team are to be involved in this ambitious international adventure alongside NASA. SWOT is the first space mission to survey the planet's freshwater resources on a global scale. The water elevation of lakes and water courses, the discharge of rivers, and the fine dynamics of the oceans are all vital data that are going to help us better adapt to climate change. In this respect, SWOT truly marks a revolution for space hydrology, and we are proud to be embarking on this endeavor with the French community of scientists, of users, and of course with our industry. I wish you a successful launch, and go SWOT, go! Go SWAT! Climate change is a topic front and center for everyone, including NASA. Joining us now is NASA's Sandra Conley. Thank you for joining us, Sandra. Thank you for having me. Now, as a leader in science, what does it mean to be part of this mission? Oh man, this is such an exciting mission. You know, it's unprecedented in many ways. It's going to be the mission that, for the first time ever, we're measuring surface water around the world. Freshwater sources, salt water sources, how they ebb and flow and, and move in between each other, how the energy is transferred across those water bodies and also with the environment. And it's really going to help us improve our weather forecasting ability and our climate prediction abilities. It's a real trailblazer. Now, SWAT is a joint mission between NASA and CNES. Climate change knows no boundaries, so why is it important for a mission to be an international collaboration? So, science knows no boundaries, right? So our scientists are from all around the world and this partnership with CNES is tremendously important. It spans over 30 years on ocean altimetry missions. And that's not even counting other partnerships that we have with, with CNES to achieve our science. So we're looking forward to many, many more missions together with them. Well, uh, Sandra, as you know, SWAT is the first uh, science team that fully complies with open science requirement. Can you tell us more about uh, NASA's open science paradigm and how do we kick off uh, the year of open science with SWAT? You know, that's a great question. Um, 
So our space satellites give us a really unique vantage point to observe the Earth, right? So um, we're able to look at it as a global system, right? And in the, um, the data that we've collected through our satellites over the 50 years allow us to really look at the, the ground, the atmosphere, and the oceans, and what open science and open data is going to enable us to do is to take that to the next level and give it to the individual user, whether they're decision makers at the local level, at the regional level, or even tribal communities, it's to give that information to people so that they can make informed decisions regardless of their business. You don't need to actually be a scientist or an engineer moving forward to be able to leverage this data and apply it to your day-to-day -day business. Looking forward to the data. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. Now, let's head over to our commentators. We are T minus seven minutes our launch of the Falcon 9 rocket from Vandenberg Space Force Base. Megan and Denton will navigate us through that terminal count. Yeah, just under eight minutes to lift off, and we are looking fantastic for launch. Weather is a go, uh, no collision concerns on the range for our instantaneous opportunity to launch at 3.46 and 47 seconds Pacific time. Uh, we see a live shot of the Falcon 9 sitting on launch pad 4 East here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Uh, this reusable two-stage rocket standing about 230 feet tall. The first stage is the bottom two-thirds of what you see there. That's called the booster. Uh, uh, and then at the uh, right over that, you see this black piece there. That's the interstage adapter, which connects the first and second stage. And then at the very top, the payload fairing. And you see SWAT uh, painted on there. SWAT is tucked safely inside of it, folded up to about the size of a mid-sized car. Engine chill. And we just heard the call out first for a stage one engine shield. And, and basically what that is, is just the getting the engine ready for the flow of the cold, cold temperatures. So it's just kind of like if you imagine if you were to jump in a really cold pool and you, you know, your muscles tense up and everything else. And you, we don't necessarily want that with the engine. So we slowly start to bleed in those um, liquid oxygen to kind of bring it down to the temperature that it'll be seen during flight. So that's, and that's really what that is. It's really preserving um, the stress on the engines and is getting ready for flight. Yeah, that was Coming a great soon, analogy. So. Yeah. yeah, you made me cold thinking <laughs> about it. <laughs> so we see some of that uh, liquid oxygen venting off now, both the first and second stages, right? Yeah, and that and you're seeing that because the, the boost is very, very cold because that liquid oxygen is inside there. And um, soon you hear the call out for stage one uh, RPO leaks. They're wrapping up um, fueling of, of the stage um, of the stage one right now. And so we should hear that call out here in a few seconds. Stage one locks load is complete. And so SpaceX is also loading helium Stage gas. Stage one fuel load correction. Into both stages, and uh, we'll, con we'll continue to top off until about a minute and a half before launch. Uh, Falcon 9 uses helium as a pressurant, meaning it uses helium to maintain pressure in the tanks as liquid oxygen and RP1 are consumed by the engines during ascent. The first stage has nine Merlin engines, hence the name Falcon 9. The second stage has a single Merlin vacuum or MVAC engine, so you'll often hear uh, references to MVAC throughout the count. Yeah. Next call out will come in just a couple of seconds. You'll hear that the spacecraft is on internal power and configured for a launch. That just means that the spacecraft is now running on batteries versus getting power from the strong vac you see there. Tanks are pressing for strong back retract. And the strong back is getting ready to retract. The strong back is, is that mechanical structure you see um, just, just to the right of the vehicle. And they, they're just pressing up the tanks and getting ready for that. You'll see it tilt back slightly initially. And then when, when we get closer to launch, you will see it tilt about 45 degrees back, um, get out of the way so you know the Falcon 9 can clear the pad with no issues. And that tilt starts when you see that cradle. It's kind of like a, a, a hug <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> around. Yeah. Just at the base of the payload fairing, you'll, you'll see those arms start to open, mm -hmm. and that will allow for the strong back to start tilting backwards. Yes, that is correct. And you can see from the video, you can see that that cradle's opening up, and then you'll see uh, a few seconds after that's completed, you know, the strong back will tilt back slightly. 
And now we're going to pause for an upcoming poll here. MLM on countdown one. MLM copies. MLM is the launch manager for this mission, NASA's launch manager for this mission. Again, we see that strong back retracting, and you see those connections between the strong back and the uh, rocket. Those are umbilicals, and that's what continues to feed uh, the rocket with liquid, electricity, gases, right up until launch, right? That, that is correct. And um, what, what, what we're, we're waiting to hear right now is just the SpaceX team confirming with the NASA launch manager that the team, team is ready to go. And so LD, MLM, countdown one. LD, go ahead. NASA is go for SWAT launch. There you go. Perfect news. Stage NASA one lock load complete. Launch. Stage one pogo. Yep, and you heard the team is all good, good to go. And so right now, stage one lock load is complete. Um, at this point in time, the stage one is completely filled with fuel. We're just waiting for them to top off the stage two tank. And today we're going to be treated to some sonic booms since the booster will land right back here at Vandenberg Space Force Base, just about a thousand feet from where it's going to launch. Yes, which is always exciting to see. I mean, it's just so fascinating that the booster is going to land basically right, just very close to where it took off from. Yeah, that's going to be great. And as you said, again, because vis visibility is so great, great we won't, won't just see the launch. We're yeah. also going to see that booster coming back to land. Yeah, and, and it's key. It's taking everything I have to stay inside and not go outside and see this <laughs> with my own two eyes. No, you have to sit in here with me. <laughs> and in these last few minutes, Falcon 9 is performing final health checks uh, on its primary communications, avionics, and propulsion systems in preparation for flight. This is the rock. Range is green. And we just heard that call out that the range is good. And we should surely we should be hearing the call out for that uh, stage two lock load is complete. And then at that point, all of the propellants will be loaded onto stage the vehicle. Stage two lock load complete. You just heard that call out, so all the propellants are done loading. And at this point in time, we're just getting gearing up for Falcon 9 to go into startup, which is basically the computer taking over and going through its last set of uh, configurations and checks to make sure that we're good for launch um, leading into T0. And remember how Denton was telling us earlier, you know, we see uh, the amount of liquid oxygen coming off of, uh, of the rocket fluctuating throughout the count here. That's what we're seeing again yeah. to maintain that pressure, the correct pressure in both stages. Yep. And what you're seeing right now is them venting the locks that was in the, the um, umbilical tower. Nine. So it's venting that out and getting it all ready for, to go for launch. Falcon 9 is in startup. And we just heard that call up, Falcon 9's in startup, which means the flight computer is taken over and is just preparing for its initial launch sequence. And now both stages are pressurizing for launch. Next call out in just a couple of seconds. Launch director, go for launch. SpaceX launch director confirming go for launch. Range remains go, weather is go. This launch will mark the 100th first mission of NASA's Launch Services bro Program based at Kennedy T Space Center. 15 seconds. Here we go. 10, 9, nine 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engine ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of SWAT, our first global survey of Earth's surface water to study how this ever-changing resource affects our climate. And there we get a nice view from the ground camera and also we switch to the onboard camera. Now, Denton, you didn't go outside to see the launch, but now we're feeling it inside here in the Mission Director Center, the rumble all around us from launch. Absolutely. And now you're getting a good look at the onboard camera, looking down towards the aft end of the rockets. You can see the, the Merlin engines coming to life there. And this room Not coming to life, really. <laughs> Lots of rumble going on in here. 
and we're soon going to hear that the rocket is supersonic, meaning it's going faster than the speed of sound, followed by Falcon 9 reaching what's called Max Q, the moment of peak mechanic stress on the rocket. Yeah. Look, we get nice views. Falcon 9 is supersonic. Yep. Just heard a call off for supersonic. Getting a good shot of looking at the onboard camera. Max Q. We just stepped through Max Q. Next call out back come. engine chill. And back engine chill, which means getting the second stage engine ready to start. And so, which means we'll be coming up on stage separation shortly, followed by stage two ignition. We see this beautiful shot of all of the uh, Merlin engines, all nine of them lit up. That's what 1.7 million pounds of thrust look Lots like. Lots of thrust. So the next callouts are going to come in quick succession, so let me walk through them really quick. So at T plus 2 minutes and 15 seconds, we're going to have main engine cutoff, that's MECO, meaning the nine Merlin engines on the first stage are going to shut down, and then a few seconds after that, stage 1 and 2 will separate, stage 1 will do a flip and do a boost back burn to orient itself back towards Earth for that landing here at the uh, Space Force base. And there we get a good shot of looking at the inner stage. Basically, Nico. the camera is looking up towards the stage second stage. Stage separation confirmed. And we just, and there you go. Live video of stage one and two separating. back ignition. And there's a good look at the back ignition coming, the back engine coming to life. That's great. You are seeing the stage one booster do its flip. And now the engine bell of the MVAC engine lit up. This is a camera shot of stage one here, again on its way back to Earth. In just a couple of seconds we're going to see the payload fairing jettison. Fairing separation confirmed. We just heard a call out for fairing separation and there's a good onboard view of the SWAT spacecraft and you can see the fairing is gone at this point in time. Another camera shot here of the engine on the second stage continuing to carry SWAT to its intended target. We have a couple of uh, camera views of this engine here, so you might see uh, a stage couple stage of different one, angles. Stage one, please back shut down. Yeah, and, it, and then you'll see it cycling through the views of the stage, um, stage two engine. And um, as we get closer to the separation, it'll, it'll go back towards the spacecraft. And we just heard a call out for the boost back burn ending on stage both stages one. Both are on nominal trajectories. And that call out was just to say both stage one and stage two doing what they were expecting them yeah. to do. And we're hoping to get a video of stage one landing. So sometimes we don't always get it because of it's coming in so fast and sometimes it's hard to capture. So occasionally, occasionally sometimes we don't get it um, all the way, but we're hoping to get a good video this time. T plus four minutes and 10 seconds into the launch of SWAT, and we've had a nominal ascent so far, no issues to report. Again, this is a video of a live shot of uh, the engine on stage two. SWAT stands for Surface Water and Ocean Topography, and this will be the first mission to provide high definition data on more than 90% of the water on our planet's surface. It's a joint mission between NASA and CNES, France's space agency, with contributions from both the Canadian and UK space agencies. SWAT is the fourth NASA LSP science mission to launch from Vandenberg Space Force Base, and the sixth LSP science mission overall to launch on a Falcon 9, Denton. Yes, and, and we got a, a lot more missions coming up on the Falcon. Yeah, to see uh, the partnership really grow for you, too. I mean, again, yeah. you, you really work from SpaceX from the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And seeing, seeing their evolution over the, the years has, has been amazing to watch. So coming up, we're going to see uh, the booster begin its entry burn soon. And again, that entry burn is to slow it down as it, as it approaches Earth for uh, the landing here back at the base instead of a drone ship. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's awesome to see it come back to land. And as, I, as I mentioned before, seeing it landing right very close to where it took off from is awesome.
So then how does this work? So again, we're going to have the entry burn that slows it down, and yeah. then there's a landing burn, right. right? Yeah, so you have the boost back burn that kind of gets it back towards the, the launch pad, and then the entry burn kind of slows it down as it's coming into the atmosphere, and then you have the landing burn that basically puts it down gently on the pad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, SpaceX has become real pros at landing yeah. their boosters. Absolutely. And it's becoming routine for them at this point in time, and so this is just a normal course of business for them. Again, we are looking live at stage two. Stage one entry burn. Now, we just heard the call out for stage one entry burn. Means it's coming back into the Earth's atmosphere. And we, there we go, we got a good video of it. Yeah, so you can see those hypersonic grid fins uh, illuminated by the flame from, uh, from the booster. Those, stage one FTS is safe. You see that the screen went black there. That's because they just the shut, down shut down the down engine. engine. That's correct. Both stages are As on planned. all trajectories. But I was talking about those hypersonic grid fins that you see. Those help guide the Falcon 9 booster back down towards Earth. So now that we're done with the entry burn, the next burn is the landing burn. Mm -hmm. It's just one engine right just before it touches down. Correctly. Just gently set it, set it down on the pad. The next milestone for the second stage is going to stage be... Stage 1 is transonic. Seco 1. Yeah, and Seco 1 is the first shutdown of the second stage engine. And we're, uh, for this mission, we're going to have two burns. So you'll stage see one, after stage 2 shuts down, it'll coast for a while. And then we got a good video of stage 1. It's about to land. How exciting. Coming in for its uh, landing burn there. Again, the grid fins moving ever so slightly to make sure that it's coming down exactly how they want it to come down. Yep, and you can see the pad coming into view. There it is. Wow, wow, those sonic and booms. And then the sonic booms. Trademark sonic booms. Wow. And good touchdown of the stage one. Touchdown. Booster. Perfect. Stage oh. one landing is confirmed. So glad to see that live yep. video. Again, sometimes yes. we don't get it. That was amazing to see. Yes. And feel, really. Yes. <laughs> see and feel. And we get to use this booster again. Yeah, yeah. Again, six, th this, would, this is the sixth flight of this booster. <laughs> this is right. Okay, so we are still awaiting again that shutdown Stage of two FTS is saved. of the second uh, 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 of second, the second stage. stage, yes. And when it does shut down, it's going to be over the Pacific Ocean, just west of the southern tip of Baja, California. Again, exactly where we want it to be, following that well thought yep. out planned trajectory. Yep, and the team is reporting back. Everything's looking normal. Stage two, it's right where it's supposed to be, and looking good. MVAC shut down. And we should see MVAC shut down coming up here shortly. And there we go. Yep, Seco 1. Nominal parking orbit. Confirmed. That's the trajectory you're seeing. It's flying south from where it just launched. And it'll continue to fly south down towards Ant Antarctica. And so again, everything going as expected so far. The second stage is now going to coast for about 30 minutes. You can see that it is shut down there from that view. And, and this is a view of the spacecraft. Again, because the payload fairing has been jettisoned, you see SWAT right there on your screen. Exposed now that we don't need the payload fairing correct. to safely get it out of the atmosphere. Yeah, correct. And yeah, once the, I mean, the whole purpose of the fairing is to protect it while the vehicle is flying through the atmosphere at supersonic uh, speeds. And then once you get up out of the atmosphere, there's nothing to, to harm the spacecraft. So you can jettison that ex extra weight and give your vehicle a lot more performance once you get rid of that extra weight. Okay. The engine not glowing orange as it had before because, again, it is shut off. So it will coast for about 30 minutes with SWAT attached to it uh, before some maneuvers are needed to keep it on the right trajectory, again, to get it in the orbit that we want it in. So mm -hmm. Denton and I are going to be back uh, then with you to walk you through those operations. But for now, we're going to send it back to Raquel and Nadia, who I'm sure are very excited to talk about how the experience launched today. Ooh, that is right, Megan and Denton. Just 10 minutes ago, we watched a spectacular launch from Vandenberg here in California. Nadia, describe what was going through your mind at that time. What a spectacular, truly spectacular launch. It was a, a, a very bright uh, splash in the sky, and a very loud one too. What an entrance. 
Uh, welcome uh, to the era of, uh, of SWAT. Uh, very excited. I've had some cheering going on oh, here yeah. at the desk. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and the car went off, yes. Yeah, we had car alarms <laughs> going off. It was really exciting yeah. here for our view. Now, soon the SWAT satellite on board will separate from the spacecraft. SWAT stands for surface, water, and ocean topography. The satellite will survey nearly all the water on Earth's surface in unprecedented detail. SWAT will provide insights into how the ocean influences climate change, how a warming world affects lakes and rivers, and how communities can better prepare for disasters like floods. And we are covering every angle of the SWAT mission from the new data the satellite will provide to how it is paving the way for future NASA Earth missions. Now, SWAT is a culmination of work by a global team of engineers, scientists, and technicians committed to improving our understanding of Earth. Let's get to know some of the people behind the mission. Planning for future generations requires us understanding how much water we have. And we need to understand the water cycle in a lot of detail, and SWAT will provide that for us. My name is Tahani Amar. I'm Cedric David. Mark Simard. Christine Jabara, and I'm an integration test engineer at JPL. I study the world's rivers. I'm one of the principal investigators for SWAT. SWAT is an Earth orbiting satellite. It stands for Surface Water Ocean Topography. SWAT will, for the first time, make measurement of water surface elevation, not only on the ocean, but also on the lakes and rivers of the entire globe. This in itself will be a scientific revolution. Collaborations and relationship build bridges, and SWAT will be that bridge across the world. SWAT is being designed jointly by NASA and the French Space Agency, with help from Canada and the UK. I was born in France, so SWAT is a match made in heaven for me. Coming to work every day, it's always really nice to know that the system that we're building will collect science data that will help people. I think, finally, I found a meaning to all of my research. I believe SWAT will create a lot of peace because we all need water. Now more than ever, it's important to recognize that water connects us all, and it might be the one thing that unites us all. You can really see how hard your team has worked there. Yeah, we have a great team, you know, we gel really well together. We scientists, we dream, and uh, engineers make our science fiction dreams come true, and then collectively we make this uh, NASA magic uh, that enables discoveries and uh, for, the, you know, for the good of humanity and science. This is magic indeed. We want to show you how some of SWAT's technology works, but to do that, Nadia and I had to go tap into our athletic skills for this one. Take a look. All right, Nadia, in order to learn more about SWAT, we have to play a little basketball. That's right, Raquel. We're trying to explain how the heart of the SWAT mission works, which is a new instrument, a radar interferometer, which we lovingly call Karen. So Karen has two antennas separated by a 10 meter boom. One of the antenna transmits a signal that is bounces back from the Earth's surface and received by two antennas with a little bit delay and out of sync. Now, Karen uses this information to compute the distance between the satellite and the Earth's surface and to calculate the water height. So let's see how we can we explain it with the basketball. Okay. You don't mind standing their feet away from me. All right, is right here pretty good? This is perfect. Okay. And we will bounce the ball just like a SWAT uh, satellite bounces a radar pulse between two antennas. Okay. So what are we seeing here right now? We're seeing how the ball, which is our radar beam, bounces over the Earth's surface. And by knowing the range, the distance, and we compute the height of the water surface. So the ocean isn't a flat surface. There's waves. Like, how do you calculate that? That's right. Let's, uh, let's bring a box. OK. So did you notice when the water is a little bit higher that the balls returns to the antenna to us a little bit faster? That's how we know that we're retrieving topography, just like in the name of the mission. A satellite is doing thousands of bounces per second to capture the data on both sides from both antennas over a wide strip on the ground, about 30 miles, 50 kilometers wide. And then once we do enough of those stripes, 
will eventually cover the whole globe. Nadia, I could really hear your excitement and passion for SWAT in that package. Why are you so excited for this new technology? Yeah, it's a really um, pivotal moment, I think, for our space science industry as we are testing um, new technology with SWAT. This is our first in-flight demonstration for the SAR interferometry, and this is opens a new uh, way of, uh, of observing uh, Earth water height. So yes, it is a pivotal moment, and I'm uh, very excited about it. Yes, and like you mentioned before, the scientific heart of SWAT satellite is the KA band radar interferometer, or Karen, and it measures the height of water on Earth. Jasmine is live at the Hawks Nest to learn more about how the technology was built. That is right, Raquel. We're back at the Hawks Nest, now joined by Ava Peral, the lead systems engineer for the Karen instrument on SWAT. Welcome, Ava. Hi. We are so glad to have you here. That launch just lit up the sky. What did you think? Oh, it was impressive, really impressive. Yes. It really was. It was beautiful. So you work on the Karen instrument. Can you tell me what sets that apart from other instruments? Yeah, so Karen is a radar, and NASA has launched radars before to study the ocean from space. But Karen is a very special type of radar. It's a radar interferometer. That means that the signal that bounces off the Earth is received simultaneously by two antennas. These two antennas are separated by a long distance, about half the size of a tennis court, and they have to be positioned very precisely to levels that are like micrometers. So we're talking about the width of a hair. So you can imagine that adds a lot of complexity to the SWOT mission, but it is that technology that enables the resolution and the accuracy that we're expected to achieve with SWOT of the uh, Earth's water. Right, so we're seeing things in a precision that we've never had before, which is very exciting and complex. So were there any challenges that your team faced while creating Karen? Yes, Karen has been pushing the envelope in many, many different fronts. I can give you many examples. One, I just told you before about the mechanical precision that we need to have positioning these two antennas. Uh, we also have a very high power amplifier. We need an enormous amount of power to be able to get that signal back to the satellite from the Earth at a level that is detectable by the radar. And that level of power at our frequency from space is by itself a technological achievement. We also have a radar, the radar produces a massive amount of data. In fact, over 60 terabytes of data every single day. And that's a lot of hard drives, as you can imagine. So we really need to reduce that data volume so that it's manageable and we can downlink it to the ground. And for that, we're doing some fairly uh, unique signal processing in the radar in space. So all of those are really uh, achievements. Uh, Karen is a unique instrument and one of a kind. Right, it really is. You and your team should be very happy with this achievement. And Ava, you yourself have been working on this for a decade. How does it feel, you know, I know those last few weeks can be like a race to the finish line. What yes. is it like that you just saw this launch? Well, it, for me, it's been my project since I started at JPL. It's been actually over 13 years. So this is really a very exciting moment for me. And uh, myself and my team have been actually working very hard uh, on what's coming ahead of us. Now that we're going to be getting the data from space, we need to make sure that the data is valid. It has the accuracy that we're expecting, and that's going to be a very difficult and critical task by itself. Right, but this is just the beginning. Ava, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Raquel, back to you. Thank you, Jasmine and Ava. Let's get to some questions for you, Nadia. Our f first question is from a young space fan, Mark Andreas. Hello, NASA. My name is Mark Andreas. How we can see water from space? Well, hi, Mark. Uh, NASA can see different aspects of water from space. 
we could see how hot is the water, how the temperature, the surface temperature of the water is, how salty is our water, salinity of ocean salinity. We can see uh, how heavy the mass of water, its gravity. Uh, we could, uh, or we can see the volume or the height of water with satellites like SWOT, for example. We could see liquid water, frozen water, like sea ice. We can even see some content of water in the atmosphere. So yeah, so we can see different aspects of water yeah. from space. Good question. Yes, yeah, so many different ways to see water. And we also have some social media questions coming in. We have, uh, how many times per day will SWAT orbit the Earth? So on average, uh, SWAT's nominal orbit is 21 a day repeat orbit. Right. And we have another one coming in for you now. See, how accurate is the equipment when measuring the current sea level from space? Meters, centimeters, millimeters, nanometers? We're really getting <laughs> into that. That the, we're, we're, we're targeting centimetric accuracy of uh, sea level measurements uh, from space, which is, a, which is a truly breakthrough. It's a 10x improvement of what we are currently doing, yes. Now you're doing such a good job answering these questions. <laughs> we have another one coming in for you. What is ocean topography and how does it work with SWAT? Well, think of it, uh, ocean topography, just like uh, mountains and valley, like I was driving here from LAX to, uh, to Lampog, just like mountains and valleys on the ground, you see hills and dips on the ocean surface. So think of it uh, as well. Great explanation. We have another question for you too. Let's get to this one is, will you be able to tell how clean the water is? So we will be able to make some uh, interpretation of water quality and its chemical composition, uh, but, but we're mostly focusing on the volume storage and, uh, and, and the height of the water with SWAT. Okay, let's see if we have another one for you. Will SWAT data help in predicting flash flooding more effectively than current technology? We are, uh, so with the, with the rising sea levels, we do uh, see uh, more frequent inundations, including those related to uh, flash flooding or, or sunny days flooding. So, and SWAT will continue uh, the legacy of, uh, of prediction of flood events uh, related to the rising oceans. We have one more social question for you to get to. Will this technology also help determine how much drinkable water is currently available? Yes, we are targeting uh, fresh water and our reservoirs in lakes uh, and, uh, and, 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 and other reservoirs. The storage, uh, the change in the volume and uh, extent. Yes, drinking uh, and available water for usage. Wow, you just offered some great insight to SWAT. Thank you, Nadia. Now, before SWAT data, researchers could only collect information on a few thousand rivers and lakes, but with SWAT, it will be more than a million. Here is a look at how that kind of data can have a huge impact on people's daily lives. SWAT is the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Satellite. It's an international satellite that's going to give us this complete view of the surface water here on Earth, what's happening in the lakes, reservoirs, rivers, and also in the ocean. It'll tell us about how sea level is rising along coastlines and in the open ocean, and really give us a good understanding of how surface water is, is moving about the Earth. Our goal is to provide data, forecasts, watches and warnings at some key locations like the Willamette River in Portland, which is a major U.S. city that historically has seen some catastrophic floods. The better quality of the data that we have that feeds into our models, the better the forecasts are going to be, the more time that people will have to protect themselves and their property and ultimately our communities. A tool like SWAT is going to help us with making these really difficult projections and predictions for the future. This is one of many reservoirs here in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. It is a human-made lake. It is a reservoir operated by the Army Corps of Engineers. The water managers here, they use you know, weather prediction, they use hydrologic models, and the hope is that data like SWAT might be incorporated into those predictions to help them better understand this water body's filling and we don't want to overtop the dams, might want to start letting water out really quickly. They have to make a lot of complicated decisions. When you get a big storm event, we want to keep the community safe in the best way that we can. So how do we best manage operation of these reservoirs in terms of putting water out downstream to prevent flooding at a larger scale? 
in lots of states, there are, you know, hundreds, thousands of reservoirs, and many of those reservoirs don't have automated gauging available. And so these agencies have to kind of estimate how much water is in them and how that's changing. And with SWAT, they can just monitor that directly from space. For us in Alaska, we have many, many rivers, and only a few of them are, we say, gauged. If we have data on when flooding is occurring or might occur, we can get crews out there to look at the bridge to make sure that the bridge and the associated roadway are still safe. If we can start collecting data on all rivers above a certain size remotely from satellites, it really opens up the amount of rivers that we can help understand what happens when they flood or how they flood. And, and that really um, improves our ability to manage our infrastructure and to design new infrastructure. That is where SWAT will really make a big difference. One of the partners we're working with is the Department of Defense, and they're trying to fill gaps in the data that they have along the coastlines. Our military is obviously very concerned about what's happening on global scales, and they have installations across the globe. So SWAT will potentially provide an opportunity to fill in some of those gaps, allow them to make the impact assessments that they need for sea level rise in their facilities. So trying to understand and give them the information they need to plan for and then potentially adapt to these changes is, is really critically important. Coastal wetlands like the Mississippi River Delta are extremely important because it acts as a buffer between us and the threatening ocean. Thank you.